So thank you so much for joining us for Naturalist 101 tonight. Um, my name is Stephanie Tuning, and I am the Coastal Education Coordinator here at 100 Miles. And I wanna give a very special thank you to our members um, for their support so we can have programs like this. Um, if you're not a member and you'd like to become a member of 100 Miles, you can visit our website at 100miles.org. Um, but I have the extra special privilege tonight to introduce my friend, Robin Barker, who is going to be our presenter tonight. Um, we've known each other for, I think, about nine years now. So this is really fun that he's doing this. He is the interpretive ranger at Cumberland Island National Seashore. He has been there for the last six years. Um, but his undergrad, he went, is from college, sorry, Georgia College and State University. Um, and he, and he also went to grad school at Kansas State and got his um, degree in geology. So no one's here to hear me talk tonight. So I am going to hand it over to Robin. And um, before I do that, I forgot. Um, if you have any questions you want to ask Robin tonight, you can do that in the question and answer. And that's at the bottom, at least on my screen, but that should be on your screen either at the bottom or the top. Um, but he's also going to ask some questions tonight. So we're going to use the chat function too. So if you want to be uh, interacted with us, you can find that chat and type things in there. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Robin. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and welcome, everybody. I'm happy to be here to talk to you guys a little bit about um, the Georgia coast and uh, kind of geologic aspects of of Cumberland Island and, and we'll talk a little bit about the Georgia coast all together as well because everything is is kind of connected so um, like I said we'll, like Stephanie said we will have some time for questions near the end uh, pop them in the chat box and we can cover if you have anything uh, about what we're talking about today um, also you know just as an overview we're going to go over um, a little bit of the Georgia coastline in general from a geologic perspective you know what is a barrier island how do they form and then we'll kind of go back in time a little bit and walk through uh, the history of the formation of specifically Cumberland Island, um, but um, it, a lot of it is related to other islands here in Georgia as well. Um, and so, you know, obviously I give this talk um, on Cumberland Island um, and to, um, so it's going to be specific to that, but things do apply for um, other aspects of the park or of the, of the Georgia coastline, excuse me. All right, so um, we'll go ahead and start, you know, by uh, talking a little bit about what is a barrier island. Uh, what you see here is kind of the textbook definition of a barrier island. It's kind of full of some jargon, and um, basically it's a uh, parallel accumulation of sand and sediments that is separate from the mainland um, from, uh, by a, a bay or estuary or a wetland complex. And uh, that's kind of a, a boring definition. And, you know, a lot of times I like to talk about how these islands, what, what is a barrier island in relation to us and to ecology and to what the function is. And so let's take a look at a couple ways we can also define a barrier island. You can, you know, talk about a barrier island as a coastal feature that serves to protect the mainland and our communities from storm surge and other uh, effects from the ocean. There's a lot of violence and, and energy in the ocean. Those barrier islands absorb as um, they interact at that uh, boundary between the land and the sea. You can also kind of define a barrier island by its ecosystems. Uh, usually you've got a marsh in the backside of an island, the landward side of the island, uh, a maritime forest or a forest by the sea in the middle of the island, kind of holding it all together. And then the dunes and the beaches uh, forming, those are kind of two separate ecosystems, but they form the seaward side of the island. And we'll talk a little bit about those ecosystems and how they really relate to an island and how they um, interact with the geologic processes on the island here in a little bit. You can also talk about an island as relation to humans. Uh, you know, they've been an important resource for humans today and throughout history, uh, beginning with hunting and gathering uh, 4,000 years ago with the early American Indians on the Georgia coastline. Uh, you had extensive agriculture on, on the islands. Uh, again, we're talking particularly about Cumberland, but it does apply to a lot of islands on the Georgia coast as well. And then, um, you know, more recently, you had uh, the island or Cumberland as, as a place for family retreats and recreation, which still goes on today um, as Cumberland is a national seashore and open to the general public for us to come and enjoy. 
So those are just a couple different perspectives you can take on a barrier island. And a lot of times geology can get pretty uh, heavy when you're talking about deep time and you go to the Grand Canyon and talk about, you know, millions of years all the way down uh, to the bottom layer and the Vishnu schist that's so old uh, down there. And, and so, you know, we're not going to go that far in depth, but it really does help that we relate it to humans. And so we'll talk about how people have interacted with geology, whether or not they know it or not, a little bit throughout uh, the talk tonight. All right, so uh, y'all are fairly familiar, I'm sure, with uh, the Georgia coastline. So I'll just quickly go through this. You know, there are a number of barrier islands along the coastline. I think the Georgia DNR recognizes 16. Not all those are seaward islands. Some of them are, um, are you know, kind of back barrier islands. Only four, though, of the seaward islands have a bridge to them. Um, and so that's, you know, Tybee, St. Simon, Sea Island, and, and Jekyll Island. Uh, the rest of those islands that are seaward are, are largely undeveloped and they're really important habitat um, for endangered and threatened animals, uh, sea turtles, uh, manatees, uh, right whales, uh, migrating shorebirds, important stopover, and many other animals um, and plants that, that find themselves out here on the Georgia coastline. Of course, it's also a really important place to study uh, the coastal processes and a lot of coastal geology uh, got its start in Georgia, which is pretty cool. All right, so we're going to kind of begin with talking about a few of the forces that shape the islands um, and before we go into how they form. So kind of talk about what the shape is today and then we'll go we'll go back and talk about their formation. So this will be an opportunity where I want y'all to kind of interact here of these four forces, the longshore currents, waves, tides, and wind, which of these do you think has the most impact on the shape of the barrier islands that we see today here in Georgia. So if you have the opportunity to uh, hop in the chat there and um, and see uh, and, and type out what you think is gonna be the biggest impact on the current shape of the islands. So I see we got some wind, we got currents. Tides, longshore currents. I got one of each now. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so we're getting getting quite a few longshore currents. All right, cool. So y'all can continue to, to to pipe in, but you know the way I phrase the question is: What force has the largest impact on the overall shape of our islands that we see today? And while all these forces do interact and do shape the islands, really our islands here are tidal influence. They're they're influenced by the tides, and we'll go over why the tidal influence is so great on the islands and compare waves uh, versus tides and longshore currents and all those kind of things here as we go. But tide is really going to be the biggest influence on the overall shape of our islands here on the coast of Georgia. Um, there's also two other forces here, storms and, and humans. And uh, hopefully if I don't jabber on too much at the end uh, before we have time for questions, we'll talk a little bit about some storm and human impacts on barrier islands uh, here in Georgia as well. Okay, let's start with longshore current. This is something that everyone's probably experienced uh, before if you go to the beach and you go out to the beach, you set up your beach towel and your cooler and your umbrella and your, you know, your cooler full of water, right? And you're out there and you go swimming to cool off and you're just floating in the waves, enjoying it. And all of a sudden you realize that somebody has picked up your stuff and moved it way at the beach. You know, how rude, you know, not respecting your, your stuff. Well, you know that your stuff didn't move, but you have drifted along the shore. And this is due to the longshore current. And this is a current that forms from the waves striking the coastline at an angle. And that creates a current that moves along the shore. So next time you go out to the beach, look very carefully at the waves. It's hard to see the angle from the shore, but you can see that action, that kind of circular action from the waves. So you watch the waves, very rarely do they go straight up and back. A lot of times they, they kind of windshield wash up and over. So they kind of do this washing thing. And that's the result of that longshore current going along the shore there. And this is a really important current. This does transport sand along the shore and between the islands. 
And so that does play a significant role in the, the movement of sand on the islands. Um, and, uh, and, and is a really important transport mechanism. And it also is, is probably the biggest thing that humans impact by hardening the coastline and constructing uh, hard barriers along the coastline. And so the longshore current does play a pretty important role in, in the coastal geologic processes. All right, now, um, really the, the shape of islands overall, barrier islands uh, are, are really gonna be either waves or tides. Those are the two predominant forces that kind of provide the overarching shape of the of islands. And so when you have uh, wave energy that dominates the coastal island formation, you get very narrow uh, skinny islands. So long skinny islands. Okay, so these uh, images here are from the Gulf Coast um, of, of Florida and the Gulf um, Yeah, I think I've got on the right is uh, St. George Island. Uh, where you know, you've got a long skinny island uh, in front of Apalachicola Bay. And then these are some of the uh, uh, Outer Bank Islands in North Carolina on the left. So they get long skinny islands and waves are the dominant energy source. However, when you have tide as the dominant energy source, you get islands that look like this. They look like a turkey leg, okay? And uh, you know, usually I'm doing this presentation at the end of the day on a day on the island. Have you ever been uh, on the island on Cumberland before? You know, it's a long day and you're you're hungry and ready to go. And so I make a joke about people being hungry, but you know, we're all I've all eaten dinner now. We're all at home, so um, that joke doesn't probably work as well. Let's draw a little outline around this uh, turkey leg here, and you can see uh, what shape we might be coming next. And and we have. Cumberland Island. So we have short, fat islands that are kind of drumstick shaped islands uh, when you have tide as the dominant energy. And really it's not only tide, tide and, and, and waves combined, but the tide is the more dominant energy source here on the Georgia coastline. Well, why do we have such a big tide? You know, and so it's, it's because of a geographic feature along the Georgia coast called the Georgia Bight. A lot of times this is called the South Atlantic Bite. You'll hear the, that, that term. I'm not too uh, pleased with that term really because we're in the Northern Atlantic Ocean and the Southern Atlantic is, is uh, below the equator uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And so we're gonna call it the Georgia Bite because we're, we're in Georgia. And that's kind of the bottom of the bowl, if you will. So what this embayment does is it acts like a funnel. And although a lot of naturalists like to use their, their hand when they're talking about this, um, I have to turn like this. You can see Florida and then the crook, crook of your, your thumb and forefinger here, that's the, the Georgia Bight. And so you've got that here that acts like a funnel. So as a tidal bulge, which of course is a gravitational bulge of water uh, pulled up by the gravitational pull of the sun and mainly the moon, as it travels around the world, it impacts the top and the bottom of that bite, roughly Cape Canaveral and then Cape Fear, Cape Hatteras in North Carolina and creates a fairly low tidal amplitude. But by the time it gets down to the bottom of that bowl or the bottom of that funnel, it has squished itself together so much that it piles up and creates a six to nine foot tidal amplitude, the difference between high and low tide, which is quite a substantial uh, tidal difference. Um, and so because of that huge range of water, it's a lot of water that's getting pushed in and out of the inlets between the islands. And that keeps those inlets open and keeps the islands kind of short and fat. And of course, if you've ever been kayaking on the Georgia coast, it, it pretty much controls your kayaking or boating plans because you, you need to plan for the, for the tide so you don't have to get too much of an arm workout while you're out there paddling. So we're gonna have another opportunity for uh, you to uh, pop into the chat here with a little trivia, uh, tidal trivia. Uh, where is the highest tidal range found on the Atlantic coast? So if you could I'll, I'll pause for just a moment and if you guys know or wanna take a guess on where along the Atlantic coast is the highest tidal amplitude. Cumberland Island. Oh, so sweet, Cumberland Island, but no, it's not Cumberland. Let's see, let's see. Yeah, we got a couple, couple of correct answers there. It's going to be in Canada, the Bay of Fundy. Yeah, so that's that is correct. Y'all were y'all were right, right on the bat there. Um, Bay of Fundy, uh, Nova, between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and they have a, a fifty foot tidal range. I mean, that's huge. Um, and so 
people and you can watch it on youtube time lapse videos it's quite interesting to see people will go out there on rafts and and uh, whitewater rafts and wait for the tide to come in it's called a boar tide like a like a wild pig because it comes in so strong like a wave so it's it's pretty impressive there um, on my bucket list to go up there and see that they'll have not made it made it up there so you know tide is a pretty strong factor in um and how these islands get their shape here in Georgia in that drumstick shape. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on. So, you know, all these forces are acting on the islands and their wind is blowing sand, the waves are moving sand around, creating the longshore current, which is moving sand between the islands. You know, how do they stay together? You got these storms coming in. How do the islands hold themselves together? Well, we look at the cross section this is the cross section from the Georgia DNR. Uh, when you look at that, it's, you know, you see this transition of ecosystems from the marsh to the forest to the dunes and the beach. And those ecosystems are intimately interconnected and they each kind of feed themselves uh, in some degree. So let me, let me kind of explain what I mean there. And so if we kind of start by these three ecosystems, you notice the pictures are, are out of order according to the island, but they are in order of their interaction. So we'll start with the salt. Oh gosh, I almost knocked myself over there. Uh, sorry, Steph, a little technical thing there. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> um, start with the marsh where you've got uh, vital habitat. You could do a whole presentation just on the salt marsh and it's important. So I don't want to belabor that point. However, in the fall, right around now, you'll see it, especially with the really high tides, the key tides we've been having with the perigeal uh, moon, the moon being so close to the earth right now, making our tidal range really, really quite high. You've got the marsh grass kind of dying back and, and floating around in the water. And the tides will push that, the marsh rack out into the beach or on, into the ocean and the waves will bring it back onto the beach. And that marsh rack will wash up, forming the rack line, and it'll, uh, you know, be little uh, pieces of, of grass on the beach. And then as the wind blows sand, especially during the winter when we have these really strong nor'easter storms that are blowing sand along the islands, that pile of grass is going to capture the sand. It's going to act like a screen and hold all that sand together. And then it's going to form baby sand dunes. And over time, those dunes build up. And then sea oats start to grow in there. And sea oats are a really amazing plant that um, act to hold the sand together by uh, building, uh, building roots. Now they don't necessarily, they have a deep root system, but they don't grow deep roots. As those sand dunes grow, they send out new roots in those layers to hold those sand, dune, sand dunes together. And so they kind of act as a, as a feedback and, and grow the dunes and the sea oats grow with them. And of course, the sand dunes, having a really mature sand dune system like we have on Cumberland Island, it really helps to protect the forest. Um, I got a little arrows here. So we'll go now, we're going to the forest. And so the forest, um, the live oak trees, the really shallow spreading root systems, they hold that sand together and really keep it from eroding. It's not very fertile uh, uh, soil necessarily uh, because of all the sand leaches the nutrients out, but it really holds it together and, and creates that um, that structure in the island, which of course, having a stable structure to protect it from the ocean and the waves and the storms allows the salt marsh then to uh, be protected and thrive, uh, hence kind of completing the cycle there in, as you can see by my arrows, uh, making a happy barrier island with our little cheesy smile here. So these ecosystems, and this is an interesting thing in geology, you know, we talk about geology and then biology and meteorology and all these different sciences that are talking about different aspects of the earth, but really they are all connected, you know, and, and barrier islands are a great example of how the biosphere and the geosphere are connected um, and, and support each other and interact with each other in a way that uh, creates a, a really wonderful um, environment for, well, not just for us to enjoy, but environment in general for uh, unique plants and animals to find their homes. Okay, um, of course, you know, just a, as a side note here, you can't have an island without sand. So where does the sand come from? You know, this is a, a map showing the drainage basins uh, in Georgia that drain into the Atlantic Ocean. 
And so these, you know, more, the majority of the land area in Georgia does drain into the Atlantic Ocean. And so it brings a lot of sediment down from the Appalachian Mountains and the Piedmont region, especially with the Savannah River uh, complex and the Altamaha River complex, which includes the Oconee and, and um, those other rivers over here. So um, if you look down at Cumberland Island, I don't know if my cursor is visible on the, uh, the screen, but you look down to the lower yellow um, drainage basin of the St. Mary's River and then the one just above it, kind of a pink color that, or a salmon color maybe, that is the Satilla River. Those are coastal plain rivers. They don't bring sand down from the Piedmont. They bring mud and you know swamp water down from the Okefenokee and uh, Satilla is mainly a, a saltwater um, thing. Oh, oh, thank you, Richard. So yeah, these, these down here, Cumberland's right in between uh, these two river basins right here. And so um, a lot of the sand that has come down from uh, the Appalachians has come down so long ago and it's gone out to the ocean and it's been reworked in the in the waves and um, so much in the in the currents of the ocean that by the time it gets to the beaches it's really fine grained. We don't have a lot of really coarse sand on the beach here in Georgia because that's really what I call mature sand and um, we'll kind of maybe come back to that near the end when we talk about um, some of the human impl influences on the coastal islands. Okay, all right, so that's a little overview of what we're looking at uh, in the shape of the island, some of the forces that control them, and, um, and how they interact with the biosphere here on the coast. And so now we wanna take a little bit of time, we're gonna go back in time and talk about uh, some of the history of the Georgia coast. And this is, again, we're the part in geology where you can get kind of lost going back in time, talking about these kind of difficult geologic names of, of past eras and eons and epochs. Uh, we're only going to go talk about two um, geologic time periods here, uh, the Miocene and the Pleistocene. We're not going to go back as far as you know, what you might experience in a geologic talk in the Grand Canyon. Um, but um, what we are going to do is talk about these two time periods. And of course, the Pleistocene is more commonly known as the Ice Age. So first, let's briefly talk about the Miocene, um, and that just kind of sets the stage for what we consider the coastal plain. So um, during that time, the sea level was much higher than what it is today, about the mid-Miocene, which is roughly 15 million years ago. And during the mid-Miocene, the sea level was so much higher that it, um, we'd be underwater. Um, well, I don't know where you are, but here on the coast of Georgia, we'd be underwater all the way up until um, middle Georgia. And over the uh, eons of time of wave action and energy along the coastline, it started to erode the rock away there on the coastline and created a small escarpment or, or a small cliff or, or bluff, if you will, and, um, and eroded that rock away there. Well, uh, at the same time, you have a very shallow sea um, that's existing in this area, you know, covering up um, the, what is to become the coastal plain sediments. And this shallow sea is rich with plankton and diatoms and all sorts of uh, really important critters that, that float around in the ocean, uh, succumbing to the whims of the currents. And so these things are living, they're making oxygen, and they're dying. And they're snowing down on the bottom, uh, depositing a thick layer of, um, of carbonate ooze, which is a, a, great, a great term. Um, so um, when this sediment piled up enough and, and the ocean eventually retreated more sediment from the Appalachians and uh, Piedmont eroded away and piled on there. The water was squeezed out of that um, dead plankton essentially and the water um, left and it became compacted and cemented. It became a limestone layer uh, and that limestone layer is now uh, the source rock for the Floridian aquifer, the coastal plains aquifer system that we uh, get our water from uh, mostly here in, in southeast Georgia and in most of Florida. And so um, 
the sea goes down, right? And we have these sediments that are accumulating on top of that limestone or what's to become limestone. And you fast way, way, way forward to human times, okay? Uh, when we go into uh, the, you know, uh, early colonial and exploration era on the Georgia coastline where you had people exploring and, you know, first settling on the coastline and then moving up the rivers. And they found the rivers on the Georgia coastline uh, quite easy to navigate. They were wide, they were pretty deep, there were no rapids or rocks in the way. And so they could bring their ocean going vessels quite far up the river until they got all the way to um, uh, a line of waterfalls. And uh, they said, oh, we can't go any further uh, than this. And so they kind of pulled over and started establishing settlements along that waterfall line. We now call it the fall line. And the towns of Columbus, of Macon, Milledgeville, and Augusta in, in Georgia um, all are established along this fall line or ancient waterfall line that denotes an ancient coastline. And so that's just, again, one factor that shows how geology has influenced human settlement. Whether or not they definitely did not understand the forces that have shaped and the geologic history that shaped the coast and the uh, middle Georgia area to bring upon that geographic feature, but they uh, reacted to it. Um, and the same type of thing is happening along the coast of Georgia or happened when these uh, towns and cities were developed there um, that we'll talk about here in a little while. All right, so let's go to the Pleistocene. Um, well, I think what we're gonna do now is actually zoom in a little bit on the coast and, and, and talk a little bit about how the ge uh, geologic history of the coastline was kind of uncovered um, because, you know, it's one thing to talk about science is another to tell the story of how the science came to be and how the understanding uh, came there. And so when you uh, zoom in on the geologic map of Georgia, I'll move my chat box here so I can see, um, you see the, um, the orange and the yellow and geologists started to find these um, kind of parallel ridges of sand uh, along that are parallel to the shore and kind of start asking questions, you know, what are these, you know, are they, are they sand dunes? Are they, you know, what are they? How do they form? And so what is going on here? And so what they did is they started to investigate and looking for evidence, you know, uh, ancient uh, evidence of, of past life uh, that could tell the story. And so what they started to do is find fossils. And one particular trace fossil allowed the geologists who were studying these sand ridges to uncover what they were, which really opened the door to telling the story of how the Georgia coastline formed. So this is gonna be another opportunity for everybody to chime in on the chat on which animal or which fossil, trace fossil, do you think they found that would um, help identify what these ancient sand ridges are? Let's see, oysters? Trilobites? Trilobites, too old. So trilobites went extinct um, 250 million years ago. So. So not quite the trilobites. Um, sloth is is a you know good guess too, and, and oysters, but those are not quite um, not quite the ones though. Oysters is a pretty good guess. It's not the shark teeth either. It's a it's something you can find on the Georgia beaches today that you might not really um, really know what it is, you know. And you're like, what is this out here? Low tide you find them, uh, they're out there, maybe little holes, little small chimneys that are up. It looks like there are someone like made a little chimney and dumped chocolate sprinkles around them. So um, shrimp is close, it's, a it's, it's not quite just shrimp, but it is ghost shrimp, there we go. Yeah, so um, ghost, ghost shrimp, you know, these, these animals have lived for a long time. They're evident in the geologic record for a long time. It's not that they found fossils of the actual shrimp, but they found trace fossils. So uh, evidence of the burrows. The burrows are very deep. They go very far down. A lot of times there may be a Y that comes together at the base. And um, 
as, as those uh, burrows are abandoned, they fill with sand. And then over time, that becomes a trace fossil that is able to be identified. And of course, ghost shrimp live in a very specific range in the beach environment. They live between, you know, like in the very low tide intertidal zone, but closer to the low tide. And so when you find ghost shrimp fossils on the eastern edge of these sand ridges, you can pretty much surmise that this is once a beach. And these sand ridges are not old dunes or, or anything like that. Or they are ancient barrier islands. And so when we're looking at that, that is, um, you know, really what, well, how, if these islands, if these sand ridges are islands, what's the process? How do they get there? And so that really started the, the whole thinking of, of how the, um, the sto geologic story of the Georgia coastline unfolded, uh, which is kind of what we'll talk about now. Um, we'll go back even before these, um, these fossils were first identified, we started looking at ways that islands form. So these are some, some of the kind of prevailing theories on barrier island formation. Um, and these were first uh, proposed uh, long ago, like in the 1800s and late 1800s. And so they are quite old theories. Um, and so the three main uh, kind of prevailing ideas on how islands form is either the channel cutting uh, through a spit uh, during a storm. So if you have a, a spit of sand that forms uh, along, a lot of times due to a longshore current that's transporting sediment and an opening kind of like what you have at Gould's Inlet or Long Point on the northern end of Cumberland Island, a, a spit forming that way, that's, that spit can be cut through uh, during a storm. And that splits the island and then you now and divides up that spit from the mainland you have an island. And the buildup of sandbars, that idea is that you've got a sandbar off the coast. So picture a St. Simon's is a great example where you've got a sandbar off the coast that's pretty popular, uh, though quite dangerous um, out there uh, due to the tide. And imagine that sandbar growing and growing until eventually at high tide, there's a little bit of sand up above it. And then uh, it allows some marsh rack to, um, to become deposited up there on the uh, on the sandbar, which captures more sand, which then birds start to land on there. Maybe the birds are pooping out their uh, salt tolerant seeds that they've eaten, and they are um, uh, plants are starting to grow there, and that catches more sand. You can have the island building up that way. So that's the idea with the buildup of sandbars um, there. And then the other um, the other uh, theory is the drowning of sand ridges with a rising sea. And so if you've got a sea level that is fluctuating. You have a rising sea level um, that drowns a sand ridge uh, nearby uh, and, and surrounds it with water. You have an island uh, that then can become reworked by all those uh, coastal forces that we talked about earlier to form a barrier island. So knowing that there are ancient barrier islands inland as far as 80, 90 miles inland from the coast of Georgia, the only theory that really makes sense um, of these for the coast of Georgia is going to be the drowning of sand ridges with rising sea level. Okay, and so we'll go into that a little bit more in depth here and talk about the mechanism for why the sea was rising and falling uh, so much within that Pleistocene time period. All right, so again, I kind of uh, explained this a little bit already. So just in brief, you've got a, a sand ridge uh, or some sort of high hill elevated area along the coast. And as the sea level rises, it's gonna flood the low areas, the river basins, the floodplains, the marshland, and the low lying land first. And then it's gonna leave and surround those higher ridges. Uh, and maybe they're uh, exposed, they're able to catch sand and uh, build up that sand uh, with sandbars coming on shore and forming a new island. And so that's really what has happened and happening along the Georgia coastline uh, multiple times over the past roughly 1.2 million years since the Pleistocene era began. So um, when we look at these ancient shorelines in a little more de detail, uh, this is kind of what we see. And so we've got um, a couple different maps here. Uh, I'll show you from a few different 
um, uh, studies and, and, and publications. And so uh, you've got a cross section on the left. You can see it is kind of a stair step uh, type of, uh, of cross section when you go inland from the sea. And it's, this is a vertically exaggerated graphic, so keep that in mind. It's not like you're going to drive up a steep hill. If you're driven, uh, if any of y'all ever driven east or excuse me west from the coast, you don't really have these large hills. However, one of the better roads to see this and experience this cross section and this kind of stair step is along 341 from Brunswick. You can kind of get the sense you'll be going up a little bit and you'll have uh, more of a pine forest off to the side and then you'll go down maybe you'll cross over a bridge over a, a, a creek and you'll see more cypress wetland plants there along uh, that low area and you're in an ancient marsh here you go back up again in the pine dry soil pine forest you're on an ancient barrier island and so these islands uh, exist all along up and down the coastline and they got great names um, of course um, uh, along the shore. There's another version of this here, color coding um, this. And, and one thing I will mention here is um, what's kind of interesting about this is if you look at the locations of a lot of the cities, uh, for example, St. Mary's and Kingsland and Brunswick and Savannah, if I move my face, uh, Savannah up here, a lot of the cities along the, the, um, the coast of Georgia are on these ancient barrier islands. And of course that makes sense. You know, if you're trying to build a city, you don't want to build it in a lowland swamp area. You want to build it on the highest elevation around, which just so happens to be an ancient barrier island. All right, uh, here's another map um, here as well. And so what we're looking at, uh, this last map are the last two interglacial periods that we're really going to talk about here. Okay, so we're going to talk about the red and the and the green, what's called the Silver Bluff and the Holocene. And so we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about that and how they relate relate to, uh, to Cumberland Island. Okay, so back to the Pleistocene here. Let's talk about why the sea went up and down. I'm realizing I'm, I'm jabbering on a little bit, so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go through this um, a little bit more um, promptly, I guess. Um, so essentially, during the Ice Age, you had several ice ages. The Ice Age was not just one ice age. It was several ice ages over a period of 1.2 million years up until about 10,000 years ago that denote the Pleistocene era. And so during these Ice Age cycles, the sea would rise and fall, coinciding with a retreat in advance of the ice. And so as you had ice expanding and growing uh, towards uh, away from the poles, those ice sheets were a mile thick uh, to some in some places, and that's a lot of ice. Then it actually contributed to a reduction in sea level. So ice advances, sea goes down. Ice retreats, sea goes up. And there are other uh, factors, uh, including ice static rebound, that are involved in this. But as a simplified version, that is uh, kind of coinciding with that retreat in advance of ice. And so you can kind of see now the mechanism for the sea le level to rise and fall several times throughout uh, the past uh, several hundred thousand years. And so when we get to the high stand during an interglacial period, uh, the sea level would go rise up to a point and it would kind of stabilize. And all the low areas would be flooded. It would um, uh, uh, surround a high ridge or a hill or leave whatever kind of high land was there um, exposed to the, the surface, and that was where sand would accumulate along uh, that exposed sand ridge. And then the forces that we talked about earlier, the waves, the currents, the tides, the wind, and the storms all reworked this sand into a, some semblance of a barrier island that we know today. And this had, and then the, a sea would retreat, and that would no longer be an island um, there at that, at that time. So specifically Cumberland Island and this, this general history does work for many of the islands, the current islands along the coast of Georgia. Um, and each one has their own specifics, um, but this, this is kind of a general talk. And so it does kind of apply to uh, some other ones. And I'll mention a few differences um, and some things to note about the, the shape of the coastline uh, when we're done with this. But for Cumberland specifically, you know, it was uh, formed basically over the course of two interglacial periods, two high stands or transgressions of the sea 
during the Pleistocene era. Uh, the last one, or the, the first one, I guess you could say, was 40,000 years ago. Uh, and that was the peak of the last interglacial period. And at that time, the sea level was about 1.8 meters higher than what they are today. It's about six feet. And at this time, you know, the sea level rose, it flooded the low areas, it left the high areas kind of high and dry. Um, and the, the forces reworked the sand and everything to form a system of barrier islands that we now call the Silver Bluff shoreline. Okay, so the Silver Bluff shoreline on our map on the right is all of the red um, portions of the islands um, here. So Kremlin's at the bottom, it's kind of the, the middle portion of it that we've got a little bit more detailed map coming. So what happened next is also really important to the story. We entered the last ice age. Um, beginning about 25, 20,000 years ago um, and ending about 10,000 years ago. And, you know, during the peak of this ice age, the sea level retreated uh, so much, it dropped about 400 vertical feet and retreated 75 to 80 miles out to the continental shelf. And so us here on the Georgia coastline, we were no longer on the coastline. We were 80 miles away. And we're just in the interior now. So these islands were no longer islands. They were just hills, just sand ridges. Now the rivers were still charting the same courses. They're still cutting deeper and deeper um, into that surrounding sediment, which is why they're uh, relatively deep today. And during this time, is a really important time. You had a shift in, in kind of ecology during the ice ages, the glaciers and, uh, and ice caps. Uh, came down and migrated down. All the eco ecosystems kind of shifted south as well. And so we had a more similar ecosystem to what you might find in central Georgia. More deciduous trees, um, more um, of those types of plants and animals. This is where you do have those sloths um, and giant ground sloths and, and mastodons and those types of animals that fossils have been found in the back barrier lagoons and estuaries in the coast of Georgia. Uh, those all uh, critters were out here during this time. What's really important though is that soil developed um, along the, the coast uh, and particularly on again you know we're talking about Cumberland here so it really developed a rich soil profile on Cumberland Island. There's a lot of folks you know a lot of times when I talk about the extensive agriculture that went on during the plantation slavery era on the island you know people are kind of surprised that so many things were grown not just cotton and rice but oranges and olives and lemons and um, pomegranates and figs and all sorts of interesting crops and it's really due to the soil that was formed during this time. You had a long period of time where the soil developed. Okay and so and then of, of course the ice age eventually ended and we entered the Holocene time period. The sea started to rise again and it, it rises up until about 5,000 years ago and it was at this point when the sea level rise slowed. And the sand that was being pushed up along with the rising sea level started to wash up on shore of that Silver Bluff Paleo Barrier Island and started to weld onto it. And so we kind of have a combination of islands here. We have the interior of Silver Bluff sediment, that higher elevation, older sediment, rich soil profile, and then a kind of rim of Holocene age sand where those two kind of uh, barrier island systems started to kind of collide together. And so looking at a, at a more detailed map, you can see Cumberland Island on the left here. Um, the Silver Bluff is outlined in the white here and all the remaining, including the little, the southern portion of Cumberland Island, all the beaches and dune ridges, all the way up, including little Cumberland Island are all sediments that were deposited about 5,000 years ago. And just to tie this back into the human history, looking back at the history, again, of Cumberland, you had Major General Nathaniel Green purchasing a one-half interest in Cumberland Island uh, to cut down the, the timber and to try and make back money from debts he incurred during the, the revolution. Um, and he wrote about Cumberland Island and how, how valuable the land was, particularly for agriculture, and how great the soil was uh, there. But he said, Paraphrasing, of course, uh, don't bother with Little Cumberland because the soil up there is not as rich as Greater Cumberland Island. Didn't recognize the reason. However, 
Little Carmelin is such a more recent island forming only about 5,000 years ago. It has not had the time to develop that rich soil profile like Greater Carmelin Island um, has as well. So that's kind of how we get to the islands. And like I said, it is a kind of similar story along the Georgia coastline. One thing though, I do want to point out on the map, if you turn your attention to the map, um, the, the kind of red and green map, let's look at St. Simon's Island and also the Northern uh, portion of Georgia coast on Ossobaw, Wausau and Tybee Island. You know, there is a wedge and it's really pronounced up near Savannah and those uh, Northern islands there is a wedge of marsh in between those islands, you know? And so you have a lot of marsh between there while you know, St. Catharines, Blackbeard, Sapelo, and Cumberland, Jekyll, the, their Holocene sand is welded right up on the Silver Bluff sand. So what's going on there? Well, what's happening is rivers uh, transporting sediment. You've got the Savannah River uh, coming into uh, just north of Tybee, depositing a lot of sediment, which uh, has build, built out those marshlands. Same thing with the Altamaha River, uh, one of the largest um, undammed river complexes on the East Coast that um, has um, uh, brought a lot of sediment down to uh, this area and kind of uh, facilitated the split between Little St. Simons, Sea Island, and, and, and uh, Greater St. Simons Island. Okay, so um, I think I've got uh, just a few last things here. I know I'm at my 45 minutes, but I'm gonna finish off these few things and we'll take uh, some questions. So if you have some questions, you can go ahead and pop them into the chat. We'll, we'll cover them here in a minute. I do wanna mention uh, a little bit about human impacts. Um, one thing, you know, Cumberland is kind of a lot of times advertised as a pristine barrier island. Um, though if you know anything about the history of the island, you know, pristine is not necessarily the best word for it because um, humans have utilized that island, including clear cutting and agriculture and Carnegie's building a power plant and building vehicles, all, all sorts of things, bringing vehicles, not building them, uh, out on the island that, that it does have a lot of impacts, uh, including the jetties that were constructed on the south end of the island in 1881. And those jetties were built on Cumberland and Amelia Island in order to keep that channel open for uh, large sailing vessels and shipping vessels that were using the port of St. Mary's and Fernandina during that time period. Well, what this jetty did was it pretty much affected the sand sharing mechanism, that longshore current sand sharing mechanism uh, between the islands. Normally, sand would be moved from uh, Cumberland Island uh, across the sound and into, uh, onto the northern end of Amelia Island. Um, and so uh, it would kind of be deposited a little bit on the south end and eroded on the north end, kind of migrating these islands to the south. What this jetty did was it blocked that sand. And so it really started to accelerate the deposition on Cumberland and the erosion on Amelia Island. And so over um, the course of the, um, you know, uh, however many years, 140 years, gosh, math, 140 years since um, the jetties were constructed, you know, you've had 400 acres of land being added on to the north or the southern end of Cumberland Island. So um, all these kind of dune ridges down here, those used to be the beach, you know, and the, almost in the, a lot of uh, land has been added down here. You know, the Carnegie time period, the beach was not in the same area, it's much further west even than what it is today. And so a lot of this area, the jetty, you can look at this on Google Earth, the jetty extends a pretty far into the interior of this Dune Ridge complex on the south end of Cumberland Island. And what this did also on Amelia Island was it encouraged the erosion of the north end. And so what they've done over there is re the beach by dredging the ocean and dumping that sand onto Amelia Island. So if you go to Fernandina Beach, you'll notice the sand is not what you'd find on Cumberland or even on south of Amelia, a south end of Amelia Island. You have really a yellowy, coarse sand, very shelly. It's got the shark's teeth in it, which is fun, but it's not the same sand. And that's because it's the immature sand. It hasn't been refined around the edges by being washed around in the ocean for thousands of years before naturally finding itself on the shore. That's a continual project that has to go on uh, because of uh, those those uh, human infrastructure projects along the coastline. 
So anytime you've got a hardening of the coastline, you're gonna have impacts that ripple down, down the coastline. The last thing I wanna mention is a little bit about storm impacts. This is not about necessarily Cumberland Island, but it is um, an interesting uh, kind of discussion here where you, um, you've got uh, some interesting storm. It is a combination of storm and human impacts. So this is the north end of Jekyll Island right here. I'm um, sure a lot of y'all have been to Jer Driftwood Beach to be here on the Georgia coastline, a very famous um, uh, beach, uh, pretty much due to erosion of the north end of the island, uh, having the beach cutting into the forest. Those trees are falling onto the beach, becoming, you know, affected by the salt, becoming driftwood. It's predominantly the live oak trees that stay on the beach because they have the wide spreading roots, almost like a jack while a, um, the pine trees have a deep tap root, like a, just like a log or a rolling pin. And so when they fall over, they just roll off into the, into the water. And so you've got those differences um, while you see the trees there. Well, a lot of the erosion has increased due to the dredging of the channel, the shipping channel there. In, in Jekyll. And of course, erosion of the north end of an island is natural, but these human influences have increased it. And then you combine those human erosion impacts with storm impacts. Okay, so I'm going to have a series of images pop up here. So this is a satellite image from 2015 that shows the north end of Jekyll Island. So uh, again, if you see my cursor, there's the fishing pier. This is the uh, Clam Creek that winds through here. Driftwood Beach is right around in this area. You can almost see the boardwalk or the pathway that leads over to Driftwood Beach right here. So I want you to focus your attention again. Hopefully you can see my cursor right here to the, in the main entrance of Driftwood Beach. So this image is from after Hurricane Matthew of 2016. You can see that sand starting to overwash right in this area, okay? And then we go after Hurricane Irma of 2017, you see even more of that sand overwashing. And if you've been to uh, Driftwood Beach in the past year or two, you, you can tell this is, this is happening. And this is kind of what it looked like right after Hurricane Irma. And this is several years ago now. And so I know that the erosion has kind of increased there. Um, and so what we're actually witnessing here is the construction of uh, an inlet right here. And, you know, if the geologic forces are, are set to work and they, they keep going and we have more storms and more high tides that are going to bring water in and out of this area, bringing sand in and out, we're going to have that creek, the Clan Creek is going to cut through that area of Jekyll Island and we're kind of witnessing the creation of little Jekyll Island um, here. And so, again, these are Natural processes, you know, when we have the human influence of the dredging and things like that, it makes it a little more complicated, but um, it's kind of interesting seeing geology in action here. Another cool factor, if you go down to this area of Driftwood Beach, you can actually see the ancient marsh that's underneath that's now being exposed, really compacted marsh. You can stand on it, which means it's ancient. It's been uh, buried under sand for a long time. We're starting to see the ancient marsh exposed now on the beaches of Jekyll Island, which is Kind of interesting um, from a geologic perspective. All right, um, that is um, all I've, I've got. So thank you all for, for listening. You know, uh, the Georgia coastline is a, a really special place and it's a great place for animals and plants to kind of do their, their thing and for us to come and enjoy and a, a place for uh, geologic processes to run their natural course, which is why uh, those of us who work in Georgia from Georgia, like myself, are are really uh, privileged to uh, live here and to have such a well-protected and uh, kind of hidden uh, gem that we have here on the Georgia coastline. So anyway, thank you all for joining us uh, this evening and I'll, uh, I'll pause and if you guys have any questions, uh, we, can, we can go from there. Yes, thank you so much, Robin, for sharing um, about all your knowledge about the geology of the coast. So yes, if we do have any questions, we'd love to answer them. Robin would love to answer them for you before we let you all go. Um, but while I was listening, I did come up with one question for you. Um, we talked about current impacts to Jekyll Island, but are there any major impacts that happened from the last couple of hurricanes and storms that have impacted Cumberland Island? Yeah, good question. You know, um, nothing on the scale of what we what I just kind of showed for Jekyll. You know, we we have had some uh, beach erosion on uh, on the beach, um, especially 
on the southern portion of the island, kind of closer to the jetty. If anyone's walked down there, uh, the the it's it's a lot different than what you see maybe at Sea Camp or a little bit further north, where you've got kind of a, a lower dunes. You have a kind of a big bluff and escarpment there, and so that that has changed. We've got a lot of sand shifting around. I mean, the dun or just just over the nor'easter recently, the Dungeness. Uh, beach crossing is completely a sand dune now. I mean, you can't, we can't even get a vehicle out there um, now. And so it's, um, it's, it, it constantly changes, but we haven't luckily seen any major impacts um, to the island itself. Uh, you know, of course, we did have infrastructure impacts to the docks, uh, which are, are being remedied in the next few months, uh, luckily. And so, um, you know, nothing, nothing major, which is, which is good. Excellent. Well, if anyone else has a question, I would love you can add them um, either to the chat or to the question and answer. Um, there was a question for me, I will answer quickly. Um, this program was recorded and will be posted to um, our YouTube channel. And if you had signed up through our form, you will get an email when that is posted. So you can revisit this lecture anytime you want. <laughs> if you need help sleeping. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know if we have any other questions for you tonight. We do have a lot of thank yous coming in, um, which of course uh, we always love to hear from our coastal partners. Um, I will give a little announcement. Our next lecture is actually gonna be on December 3rd, which is much uh, earlier in the month than normal. Um, and it's actually gonna be about deep sea mounds that have been found and some deep sea corals that have been found off the South Carolina and North Carolina coast over the last couple of years. Um, so you won't wanna miss that um, as well. Um, okay, oh, sorry, just a comment came in. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight and um, we hope to see you at another program soon and a special thank you for Robin for joining us this evening and we'll see you all soon, thanks. Oh, I think we had a texted question. Oh, sorry, okay. one more question yeah. before I let you go. Sorry, yeah, yeah. telephone. Um, was the ocean noticeably saltier during the last ice age? Oop, hold on, I lost my text. Um, was the ocean noticeably salty during the last ice age with so much ocean water locked up in the ice caps um, on the mainland? That's a good question. Um, ah, man, I'm not gonna be able to answer it off the top of my head. Um, I don't know if it was going, it necessarily gonna be um, that much saltier and there are a lot of natural uh, balances within the ocean that kind of reg self-regulate a lot of the uh, salinity in the ocean but unfortunately I'm not going to be able to answer that uh, satisfactorily um, uh, tonight so I, I don't want to say something that is incorrect but um, I don't think it was going to be that much of a change um, compared to what you might see in a deep saline aquifer or something like that. Okay, well, thanks for answering as best you can. I don't have to answer that one either. <laughs> um, well, again, I sold my textbook. <laughs> well, thanks again, Robin. Uh, thanks for joining us um, and teaching us all more about the um, geology of our coast. Um, and I hope you all have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Well, have a good night, everyone. Take care.